We're going to move on in the book of Romans. We've been in some heavy, heavy doctrinal stuff in the book of Romans. But now we're going to get to the hard stuff. And you think, my, it's already been so difficult. But this hard stuff is not so hard to understand. I call this the hard stuff because it, it lays out very plainly what it says, and it requires something out of us. I think it's Mark Twain that said, it's not the parts of the Bible I don't understand that bother me. It's the parts I do understand. And when we read this in Romans, we're looking at something now that's going to require something out of us. This is where we get to the application part. And uh, I'm reminded of when Paul wrote Timothy, uh, uh, wrote Titus. He said to preach the things and teach the things that become sound doctrine. Now, it's, the th it's not that the things he teaches turn into sound doctrine. That, that's not what it's talking about. The word become there is used like it's becoming. You've seen people maybe complimented someone on, on the way they're dressed. So that's very becoming to you. It's very fitting for you. It, it just, it's just compliments you. So Paul tells Titus, you teach those things that are becoming to the kind of doctrine that is good. And that's what Paul's going to do here in the book of Romans. It's things that are becoming to the doctrine that he has been teaching in those first 11 chapters. Now, when you read Romans 12 here at Rockcliffe, those of you that have been here a while, it should stir an emotional response to you, a very good emotional response to you. And jog your memory. Catherine Winton wanted this read at her funeral. And that, that registered with me. And those of us that had been here long enough to know Catherine would know why. Not, and, and for those of you who hadn't been here, it wasn't Catherine. It's Catherine. Catherine Winton. That was her name, Catherine. And uh, she wanted Romans 12 read at her funeral. If you knew her and you knew she had done this. I've got it written right here in my, my large wide margin Bible. I've got Catherine Winton right there at the beginning of Romans 12. And so it stirs that kind of emotional response. I tell you, once you've been part of a congregation, the influence that you have had and the person you have been, it will linger on long after you're gone. And uh, Catherine's influence is still felt around here. We're, we're better people because of the influence that she had on us and who we are. And so it ought to stir a very pleasant and, um, and delightful <laughs> emotional response to us here at Rockcliffe when we come to Romans chapter 12. Now here's where we are. We're getting down toward the end of Romans. All that front part has been very doctrinal. But now I call this section 11 here. Of therefore perform your reasonable service to God and man. We're going to be talking about reasonable service. And now we've got obligations to God and obligations to man that are going to be spelled out by this chapter. That'll go from Romans 12, 1 to 15, 12. And then we're going to be getting into Paul's closing remarks and the plans that he has. Here's what we've got in Romans 12. Three parts. I'll watch the time. If I don't get all the way through this, we'll pick it up then uh, in another lesson and continue on. Sometimes people talk about preaching style. Preachers, preachers, I guess, get, get hung up on preaching styles. I tell people, I try to preach like a Bible teacher. That's just, I could almost just teach a class just as soon as I could stand up and preach. In fact, sometimes it's easier to preach than teach a class. Because not very often when I'm preaching, does someone raise a hand and ask me a question and throw me off? You know, they'll do that in a class. But uh, so I'm going to preach like a Bible teacher here. Let's look at these three sections. Starts off a living sacrifice. I wasn't sure whether to make that one and two or one, two and three, as you'll see here in just a minute. And then there's many members in one body talking about how the church is to function. There's many members in one body. And then a section that I call Paul's Proverbs. 
And I count 20. It's going to depend on how we count them. But uh, because you can combine some and separate some out as you go through here. But I count 20 of Paul's Proverbs here. And that's what we'll do in Romans 12. I beseech you, therefore. Therefore is an important word in this. And, and the fact that he's beseeching you. <clears throat> Paul is an apostle of Jesus Christ. And he had the authority to say, I command you, brethren. And, and he could have done that, and we would have been responsible for that command. But he appeals to something in us that with the idea that we really want to do this anyway. We don't have to be commanded. All I have to do is beseech you ask you, earnestly entreat of you, brethren. And that would be the response because we want to do what's right to start with. And so he says, I beseech you, therefore, in view of all the things we've had and by the mercies of God, that's what we've been studying. God is a merciful God, a gracious God, a good God. And if someone's appealing to us on those attributes of God that stirs a response within us, God's that good to us, then what does God, what would God desire out of me if I know I don't have to be commanded. Simply knowing that's what God would like out of me, that's enough because I love God. He's been so merciful to me. So I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now let's look at that word reasonable service. The New International Version translates that, which is your service of worship. Now because of that, there's a lot of people that have turned to this verse and say, well, everything we do in life is worship. And they've even gone so far as to say there's no acts of worship that we do when we gather together. It's just since everything we do in life is worship. So uh, when you're brushing your teeth, that's worship. When you're uh, uh, when you're trying to start your car, that's worship. And so everything you do in life is worship. But that's not what this passage is teaching. That reasonable service. It's it's not an easy word for the translators to translate for us. And that's why when you see different translations, that they're trying to get at that word with English words that, that vary because it, it's hard to zero in on what would the best translation of that be. But let me tell you what this is talking about. It's talking about the kind of service that a priest would perform when you would go to that priest with your sacrifice and say, would you sacrifice this, this lamb for me? And then the priest would serve you. He would take that lamb and he would go make that sacrifice for you. That's the word that describes that kind of service. You see how that plays into what Paul's talking about here? Present your bodies as a living sacrifice. That's your service, your priestly service, your reasonable service, your service of worship. And, and he's using it in an analogy. He's making the analogy of how we're to present ourselves to God just like we would carry a, a, a dead sacrifice to God you be a living sacrifice. And just as the priest would perform that service for you and offering that dead sacrifice, you be your priest that offers yourself as that living sacrifice. You see the analogy there? And once you see the analogy, then it becomes clear. Paul speaks in analogies like this. And present your bodies 
That destroys this idea that it's my body, I can do with it whatever I want to. We read in the book of Corinthians that, no, you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. It's not just your body anymore. You have sacrificed this body, which means this life that you live here in the flesh to God. That's your, that's your service to God. Just like the priest would perform that service. That's your service as a priest of God. To, send, to use your body in his service. So it's holy. See how it's set apart? And you want it acceptable to God. Watch what you'd want with an animal sacrifice. So that's what you want with the sacrifice of your life. And then he says, be not conformed to this world. Look at that word conformed. When I think on that word, I'm thinking of pouring something into a mold. Now, now when I was a, when I was a little boy, I had a little mold and it was two miners and a dog and they were on these plates and I could stick those two miners and this dog together and passing those plates together and then I had these little, th I could heat the lead and pour the lead into the mold and then when it would cool I could break that thing apart, and I had made two little lead miners and a little dog. It was a toy, and then I could break off the extra lead, and the, the hot lead would conform to the mold. The world wants to put you in their mold. There's a certain expectation out of the world about the kind of person we ought to be. And they want you to be that person. And they are going to resist you if you don't conform to their mold. If you don't conform to the world's mold, they're going to feel threatened by you because they can't control you. And so Paul is telling us when it comes to this world, you're a nonconformist. Now, this is the same Paul that said, I become all things to all men if by any means I might win some. Paul wasn't saying, make sure you go out in the world and you really stick out as an oddball. He's not saying that. There's certain parts of this world we ought to be able to fit right into and blend right into. But there's other things about this world that we're not going to go there. We're not going to have any part of that. And we're not going to conform to the morals and the ethics and the, the manner of life that is in the world. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. Conformed and transformed. I have a little electric train set. I set it up under the Christmas tree and run my train on it. You plug it into the wall. If I plug that track directly into that wall, man, that thing would not only shock me, it would burn that train up. They have to change the amps and volts on that for that to work. And there's a little box that does that. It's called a transformer. It changes that circuit into what it ought to be. That, that word transformed, you might recognize the Greek word for that. Metamorpho. Have you heard of metamorphic rock? Let me remind you what it is in case you, you don't remember. You might remember, but I would have forgotten if someone didn't remind me. You take a rock, and, and rocks are formed certain ways. You take a rock that's formed in one way, and then you submit it to heat and pressure, and it rearranges the molecules in that rock and it comes out a different kind of rock. It's called a metamorphic rock because it's been changed from one kind of rock into another kind of rock. You, you know what they call the, the process that changes a caterpillar into a butterfly? That's metamorphosis. 
It works for tadpoles. They'll turn into frogs. But somehow the caterpillar to a butterfly seems more beautiful. You know, ugly old caterpillar worm. And then comes out this beautiful butterfly with these wings. Transform, metamorphosed. That's the word used. Be transformed. Now, how are you going to do that? How can you take a person that is one way and turn them into a different person? How are you going to do that? You know, there's an old uh, adage that says, you're not what you think you are, but you are what you think. It's what we are in our minds that become who we are. And that is our spiritual nature. We're not who we are by instinct. It's what's in our minds. And it's these thoughts of God that go into our minds that change us into a godly person. And so you're transformed by renewing your mind. You're going to have to think different than you've thought before. You're going to have to feel about things. that There may be things that you used to love that you're going to have to learn how to hate. And things you used to despise that you may have to learn how to love. You'll, you'll change your thinking. And you'll bring that thinking in line with the thinking of God. Now remember that. You're transformed spiritually. And that means it renews your mind because the mind of man is part of his spiritual nature. So be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove. Now the word prove here means you're going to learn this by putting it to the test. You know, it's one thing to read all the theory it's another thing to put your hands on and actually do something. And then you prove it. And so you put it to the test and find it to be true. That's what the word prove means. So prove what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. You don't just know it. You take what you know and you apply it. And then you'll learn by what you have done just how good and perfect and acceptable God's will is. What a power-packed two verses. But now I want you to remember this. Transform by the renewing of your mind. The mind. You think with your mind, don't you? Go to the next verse. For I say through the grace given to me that every man among you not to think, think, more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt with every man the measure of the flesh. See how that fits into the renewing of your mind? Think, think, think. That's what it's talking about. And so Paul immediately starts showing us how we need to think. It says, I say through the grace given unto me. Now, Paul was a recipient of God's grace. He had been a persecutor of the church. He was ashamed of who he had been, but he had changed. And God's grace not only changed his thinking, he enabled him to be an apostle to teach us these things. So by the grace given to me to every man among you, don't think too high yourself. Uh, more high than you ought to think. Now, that doesn't mean be down on yourself. There is a certain level of what we ought to think. We ought to, we ought to like ourselves, but not too much, not too high into thinking somehow I'm better than everyone else. And some people think the whole reason I live is for number one. Well, that's not the way the Bible teaches us to think. We live for others and we live for God. So think highly of yourself, but not too highly of yourself. Think soberly. That means there's some seriousness here. The Bible is a sobering book, isn't it? 
It'll sober you up in your thoughts. Think soberly according as God did doubt to every man according to the measure of faith. And that's why I put this here into the second part about being all one body of Christ. The church is not about the preacher. It's not about any one of you sitting in the pew. And if you come to church and you get this idea, okay, this is all about me. You're not going to enjoy worship. You are simply a part of a body. And the body is not all about the part, but it's all about all the parts fitting together and doing their functions together. And that's what Paul's talking about here. He talks about this in several places. He'll talk about it in the book of Ephesians. He'll talk about it to the Corinthians, but he talks about it to the Romans. We have a measure of faith. Some of this language is a little strange here. He's using the word faith in a little different manner. And he's talking about these different functions and parts of the body at a time when there was miraculous gifts. Everything he says here is not necessarily about a miraculous gift, but it has to do with God. He knows what part we need to play. And he has enabled us to play that part. That's what is behind these words, the measure of faith, what you're prepared and ready to do. God has provided the means for you to do that. So we have many members in one body, but all members have not the same office. And you'll remember in Corinthians, he says, uh, if I'll ball with the eye, well, where were the hearing? And uh, you couldn't have a body that's just one big eye. You won't want a body that's just all one part. So we're all different. We're very diverse. Unity doesn't mean uniformity when it comes to our personalities and our talents and our abilities. And we share and we take part. And they're the things that you can do best, you do. And you cover for me and the things I'm not so good at. And it goes vice versa on that. And so... Part of really fitting in as a part of a congregation is coming to realize and learn this is where I can provide an asset. This is where I can be valuable and fill that role. And don't try to fill roles. Don't, don't spend a lot of time trying to fill what you're not really too capable of doing, but do that part that you have been created for to do. And so there's a whole body. So we being many are one body in Christ and every one members one of another. And so having gifts differing. Here's the seven gifts he mentions. Prophecy, ministry, teaching, exhorting, giving, ruling, and showing mercy. And we're not all equally equipped to do all of these things. Don't get down on yourself because there's something there that you're not very good at. Look at what you're good at and focus on that. It says, if prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Prophecy usually has to do in the New Testament with those men that had a gift to reveal God's word. The word can be used accommodatively of someone that is speaking out and speaking for God. And so there's a sense in which you can say the preacher is prophesying, not that he's speaking by inspiration, but he's trying to get God's word off the print and return it to the spoken word that it originally was. But in the New Testament use of that word prophecy, it's usually associated with a spiritual gift. And we'd have to kind of kind of stretch it to, to take it away from that. But if prophecy, then prophesy the measure. Our ministry, let us wait on ministry. There's different kinds of ministry. And I don't really like, I don't object, but I don't really like being called the minister because I know there's many men. I, people, I hear preachers say, when I entered into the ministry, well, there was a time I entered into the ministry. It's when I came up out of that water of baptism. I became a servant of the Lord. That's when I entered the ministry. And there's different ways to minister that way. And so the idea is a servant. 
And some people are just good at serving others better than others are. Is ministry, it says, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching. I tell you, not everyone's a good teacher. But some do that. Now, a lot of people can learn to develop that ability to teach. But you want to get your best teachers doing most of the teaching. And you want to try to train others to teach as well. But everyone doesn't have to be the teacher. So he that teacheth on teaching, he that exhorteth. That's the encourager. You know, there are some folk you just love to be around. They, they just naturally do it. They just encourage people. Lori and I were at Fazoli's uh, last night, and the little girl that waited on us was complimenting everybody about something. Somebody did a good service. I, I think she liked my shoes. She found something to compliment, you know. Well, his shoes, I'll say that, you know. But she was just, but everything she said was some kind of positive reinforcement for someone. Barnabas was that kind of man, an exhorter. And, and that is something that a lot of us can really excel at, coming together to exhort and encourage one another. That's the Lord's work, and you're part of the body. And then it says, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. The Lord's enabled some people to be givers. In fact, he has blessed some people with more material things and if you are blessed materially, you might think, why am I blessed so materially? Maybe it's because God expects me to be a giver. Now, how are you going to be a giver? Like the Pharisees? Sound the alarm, blow the trumpet, and look, look at this fantastic gift I'm giving. No, no, do it with simplicity. Just let it be an easy thing. to Just give. Don't make a show of it. It's not that you're hiding that you're giving, but you're not trying to draw attention with it. You just give. Let it be a simple thing to do. It says, he that ruleth with diligence. You know, some people just aren't cut out to be rulers. But some people do it very well. They know how to take charge. They know how to delegate. They know how to see after things. And people like to follow them because they build that trust and they're glad to follow a good, a good ruler. They're glad to comply with that. Some just don't have that ability to do it as well. They're better off being the minister than the ruler. But if you're going to rule, be diligent about it. And particularly the Lord's rule, take that seriously. And then hear he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. The Lord loveth the cheerful giver. And when you're being merciful to someone... It may be you've got flowers for them, if you've prepared food for them, or you, you're checking on them. I tell you, your cheerfulness may be the best gift they receive. And so don't show mercy as though in a way that you're strained and you feel compelled and you have to. And just let people, let, let them know you are glad that you're able to be of service to them in this manner. And so he's showing us how to be parts of that body. Now, let's get to some of these Proverbs. And I've got a few minutes. Let's look at some of them. I don't know if we'll get through all of them, but let's look because they're important. And I numbered them in the, the little out in the side of the Prince of Thieves. That's the verse that you're going to find this in. Sometimes there's one in, it, it takes more than one verse, but sometimes there's two or three in one verse. So let's do this one. Let love be without dissimulation. Dissimulation is a word, it means hypocrisy. And don't, don't fake it. The people can tell when you're faking it. And it ought to be genuine love. The word translated love here is interesting in that it's the agape love. This is the kind of love you give when you're not expecting anything reciprocal from that. It's all focused entirely on the object of your love. And that's why the Bible can say love your enemies. You're not expecting the enemy to, to reciprocate that love, but still you have that attitude toward them. It's not necessarily a warm feeling you have toward them, but it does have to do with the manner in which you treat them. And because that love is always Agape love is always so much tied with what you do. That's why a lot of times the King James Version translates that charity. It's an act more than a feeling. And so don't fake it. Let it be genuine. 
Let love be without dissimulation. Number two, abhor that which is evil and cleave to that which is good. You go to the book of Proverbs and there's a lot like this where it's kind of this and that and this and that and they parallel. Now, you know what cleave means? That means you hang on to it. You know what abhor means? Have you ever pulled something out of your refrigerator that's been there a while and you know, what was that? I, I forgot that was in the back of the refrigerator. What is in here? And you open it up and as soon as you do, you go, whoa, that's what abhor means. Just, oh, you just want to stay away from it. You find something evil, have that attitude. Oh, I don't want to be around that. But then you hold on tight and cleave to that which is good. Number three, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. That's a different word. The Lord did not say be kindly affectionate to your enemies. He said agape your enemies. He didn't say have brotherly love with your enemies. That's phileo love. He said agape love. But you phileo love your brethren. And sometimes we get so hung up on the, the idea that, that love is not a feeling that we forget about phileo. Phileo is a reciprocal love. That's the friendship love. And the kindly affection, that is your feelings and attitude. And so, yeah, we're going to let love be without dissimulation. Let agape be without dissimulation. But don't forget, we're also to be in our feelings. Kindly affectioned with brotherly love, phileo love. It's a different kind of love, but one is not to the exclusion of the other. And so we do develop among ourselves, among our brethren. We just love each other with all the feelings that go with that love. In honor, preferring one another. There's a lot of people at Rockcliffe that are pretty good at this one. I don't want to name names, but the other day I saw something that I thought was pretty good and I thought I knew who did it. And uh, I sent a text and said, thank you for this. You know, this just looks really good. And I got the text back. Oh, don't thank me. You need to thank so-and-so. I was just helping. And so I turned the text and thank the other person. And they said, oh, don't thank me. Thank the other person. I was just helping. <laughs> Almost the same response. It's because what are they doing? In honor, preferring one another. I, I knew a man, and I love this man. And I'll tell you, the place I was worshiping at that time, it probably would not have existed without that man. He was so good at giving and seeing after things and doing things and seeing that things were done and that he was worthy of a lot of credit for what that church had become. But there was a problem. He wanted that credit. He was always telling people he's the one that did it. If you were to say someone, boy, that, you know, what you did to that wall, that really came out good. He would say things like, well, now I'm the one that picked out the paint for that wall and showed him how to do it. He just kind of sucked the credit away from everyone and, and he was starved for that attention. And it really hurt him because there was no question of all the good that he was doing for that church, but the fact that he always had to get the honor for it kind of took the, the joy that we would have had in him away from it. And so we don't want to be like that. In honor, prefer one another. There used to be a little sign. My dad, when he was preaching in Chattanooga, Tennessee, he had a glass top on his desk and he would find some little saying or something on a piece and he'd slip it under that glass top to remind him and I remember as a little boy I'd go in there and read those things and one of the little signs I remember he had was it's amazing what you can accomplish if you don't care who gets the credit and that's embodying this about in honor preferring one another you want credit God who seeth in secret will reward thee openly. God knows. And that's where we ought to be glad to have the, 
that where the credit goes, that God knows and be satisfied with that. And uh, don't worry about getting the honors for yourself. Prefer others get that honor. Let's see. I'm going to have to stop. Let me let me get through these parts of them. Now go to the, the other. But not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. You know what slothful and fervent, fervent means with heat. And I tell you, that includes in business. We're all involved in some kind of business. And what we do, we don't need to be slothful about it. People ought to know, look, if you ask them to do it, they're going to do it right. They're going to be diligent about it. They're not going to be slothful about it. You can count on it. And so fervent, be, have that burning desire to do that. But particularly when it comes to the Lord's work, because there have been those that, boy, they would do good at their business and then act like almost anything goes when it comes to the Lord's work, particularly with the Lord's work. Don't be slothful in spirit. Be fervent in that business, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope. Now we're going to read where we rejoice with those that rejoice and weep with those that weep. And anything is hopeful like that. You know, Bible hope is based on a confidence. It stands on the confidence of faith. And that gives us a confidence of hope. And in all the trials that we have, we have reason to rejoice because we have hope. Rejoice in hope. Patient in tribulation. Now, you might have been able to combine those two. That means you hang with it. You stick to it. Patience not talking about just waiting there calmly. It's talking about hanging on. The, the word literally means to bear under. You get under the load... And it gets to be a heavy load. And you stay with it. And so in all the trials that we have in life, we're patient. We bear with them. We endure. And we overcome. Rejoicing in hope helps us do that. And then continuing instant in prayer. I know Paul says pray without ceasing, and some have taken that to an absurd idea that we ought to have our mind on prayer all the time. Every time we're doing anything, we're just praying constantly like that. And that's not probably even good for mental health to be like that. That's not natural. But we are to pray regularly, and we ought to be able to have prayer just as handy to us as a handy little tool. We can continue instant in prayer. Soon as I need to, I know whatever comes up, I've got prayer. I'm going to pray about it. And so as things happen through the day and things come along, what am I do? Well, first I'm going to pray about it. What I'm going to do and keep prayer handy like that. It's like Paul said to those in Philippians, the Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing. But in everything, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. God's just that handy. He's right there. He's at hand. And you just continue in prayer. Um, I'm torn with what to do. I kind of want to get through the last eight, but I'll tell you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop here. I'll, I'll pick up right there in verse 13, because this can just keep going. And it'll go on to the next chapter. And I'll do that next Sunday. We'll start there with uh, 13. Now, Wednesday night, I might go ahead and ask questions on the rest of the chapter, okay? <laughs> but I'll stop here tonight. But think about those Proverbs. Let's just read them right quick. Distributing necessity of the saints, given to hospitality, bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not, rejoice with them that rejoice, weep with them that weep, be of the same mind toward one another, mind not hot, high things, condescend to men a low estate, be not wise in your own conceits, recompense no man evil for evil, provide things honest in the sight of all men, if it be possible as much as life, then you live at peace with all men. And dearly beloved, Avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. We're going to talk about those then next uh, Sunday night. And learn from these things how we can present 
the life that we live in this body is a living sacrifice to God. Well, Christianity, what God has laid out for us and what he expects out of us, what kind of people he wants us to be and attitudes he wants us to develop, it brings out the very best that God has made us to be. And so let's think on these things and meditate on these things and implement these things. This is what we do. You can't just listen to it as a doctrinal idea and say, yeah, I think I understand that. This is something you don't just understand. It's something you put into practice. That's why you prove it. Now, you need to be a Christian. Baptized into Christ and become one of God's children and develop these attributes and attitudes. So if you're ready to do that tonight, let's do it as we stand and sing.